In March of 2021, a year after the release of Doom Eternal, players were finally able to play the second DLC expansion, The Ancient Gods Part 2, which was included in the game's Year One Pass, and available for purchase to anyone who wanted to buy it separately. Both expansions for The Ancient Gods, from here on referred to as Tag 1 and Tag 2, were controversial when they launched, for very different reasons and Tag 2's controversy was far greater than Tag 1's, leading to the darkest moment in Doom Eternal's currently short history, which then led to a remarkable recovery that ultimately left the community and the developers in a much better place, and helped to open lines of communication so that both sides understood each other better. Tag 2 was met with community-wide scrutiny for several reasons, mainly its difficulty or lack of it. And though the dislike for Tag 2 was certainly not universal, many of the prominent community voices were quick to lash out against it. Tag 2 has its fans. At the end of the day, I'd wager it has just as many as Tag 1 when considering all players. And even I, someone who dislikes Tag 2, can find things I like about it. Certain arenas, new enemies… I still play through it from time to time. You may be someone who played Tag 2, had a great time, and were left wondering what everyone was so upset about. On the most superficial level, one could simply say Tag 2 is too easy, and the hardcore player base didn't like that, so they cried about it. But what really happened requires us to go back and put everything in context. We gotta start with the 2016 Doom reboot. Doom 2016 came out after a 10 to 15 year period that was largely dominated by shooters like Call of Duty, Halo, Gears of War, Counter-Strike, franchises that took over after the fall of classic 90s arena shooters. Not every game was made to be like those games, of course, but for a considerable amount of time, if you put a new shooting game in front of your average player, they were expecting to find a regenerating health system, weapon reload mechanics, probably a 2-3 weapon limit, a sprint button, cover opportunities, and all the other things that were staples of FPS gaming at the time. This isn't about saying what game designs are good or bad, just that a lot of players were conditioned to expect those things after having played so many shooters that functioned that way. The Doom reboot itself seemed to be heading down a similar path, at least from the small amount of prototype footage we've seen. It's hard to say really, we don't have much to go on, but it looks to be kinda slow paced. It's got the brown, grimy look that you saw in a lot of late 2000s games, and though it was implementing what we now know as the glory kill system, the game obviously wasn't going in the crazy rip and tear direction that the reboot ultimately went in. When they decided to mostly scrap Doom 4, which came to be known by some as Call of Doom because of its military feel, id Software took the series back to its 90s roots, which was fast running gun action. Now, Doom 1993 and Doom 2016 certainly have their differences, how could they not when they're decades apart? But Doom 2016 wanted players to find themselves charging in to confront the demons, in an aggressive style like they would in the originals. They coined the term push forward combat, and they incentivized aggression and movement, where a lot of players were used to being able to take cover and wait for their health to come back. Doom 2016 put enemies in front of you that would run in and chase you out of cover, and the glory kill system meant that if you wanted to refill your health during combat, you had to go into the fray and take it from the demons. If you couldn't find ammo, you had to chainsaw someone to refill your guns. It was a very active gameplay experience that prioritized movement, aggression, weapon variety, and resource management. Movement was further incentivized by the AI having less accuracy while you're moving. As long as you were moving, projectiles were probably never going to hit you. It's a pretty easy system to exploit looking back at it now, but Doom 2016 was made as the first step in a plan to get people into the fast aggressive style of classic 90s shooters like Quake, Duke Nukem, Unreal Tournament, and the original Doom. Doom 2016 did a good job of getting people moving, and going into the sequel, they knew that wasn't going to be enough. Players of Doom 2016 were already going to be moving when they went into Doom Eternal, so it was time to push them further. Doom Eternal put more pressure on your resources, and showed players enemy weak points that could be targeted using specific weapons, getting players into a system of regularly cycling through their arsenal to more efficiently kill the demons and spread out their ammo supply. 
Eternal is a game that says it's not enough to just generally move around and abuse unbalanced weapons. You gotta learn how to play the game well, and master all your tools to achieve the power fantasy you want. Eternal is designed to push a new player just hard enough so that they'll eventually fall in love with the weapon variety and multitasking around their equipment options. You'll be burning multiple enemies at once to recharge your armor, using grenades to set up falters on armored demons so you can get close for a blood punch, breaking the weapon of a dangerous enemy to relieve some pressure, switching weapons during a combo to increase your damage output. It's a more involved experience that sets out to turn you into not just an aggressive player, but a smart and skilled one. It's a game that made a lot of people just straight up better at shooters in general, which is what they wanted to do. Like how Rock Band could teach you how to play drums, or Factorio can make you think like an engineer. The skills you learn in Doom Eternal can be taken into other shooters, and then you'll be playing those games better too. It can even change how you see game design in general. It really comes down to the famous power fantasy statement that director Hugo Martin made. The power fantasy that's earned is much more satisfying than the one that's just handed to you. Remember this, it's key to understanding the reaction to Tag 2. Doom Eternal was pushed as a skill-based game that will turn you into a black belt and ask you to master all your tools to become the ultimate killing machine. That was a very clear message, and in the months after Doom Eternal's release, there was a significant player base that continued to play the single-player campaign, raising the difficulty, finding new tech, discussing weapon balance. A bunch of YouTube channels sprung up talking about different aspects of the game. An entire community emerged, one that dwarfed what you saw in 2016. The engagement numbers were much higher, sales were great, and everyone was looking forward to the first DLC expansion set for late October of 2020. And something very important happened a month before. A community-made PC mod came out, introducing a horde mode to the game. The modders Prote and Solart gave us 14 rounds of ramping up insanity that demanded a mastery of combat. I remember when I first played it, it destroyed me. I was already someone who could comfortably pass the base campaign on Ultra Nightmare, I beat the two included master levels, and I played the game with a restricted rule set to make it more challenging. But Horde Mode kicked my ass. All the stuff I wasn't using was now required. I used to not use the Ballista hardly at all, because I always felt like railguns didn't belong in Doom, I thought that was more of a Quake thing. Horde Mode got me to use Ballista because my life depended on it, and now I love the gun. I used to generally ignore enemy weak points after my first couple playthroughs, but now I was regularly targeting them to cause the enemies to falter. Blood Punch became a lot more important. I was switching weapon mods more frequently. Horde Mode made me, and a lot of players, better. But it was just a mod. And the modding community is relatively small compared to all the players that don't play PC mods, and the large console audience that doesn't have access to them. However, a lot of the voices of the community, the YouTube channels, the streamers, the speedrunners, were all playing Horde mode, and began to shift towards a view of the game that promoted very high-level skill. id Software knew that the player base was leveling up over all this time, and they wanted to deliver a suitable challenge in the first DLC. So now we have to talk about what kind of DLC Tag 1 actually is. The Ancient Gods is not a traditional DLC by modern standards. When a game releases a DLC expansion, people are usually just expecting more of the game. New levels, more story, maybe new enemies. But they're not expecting a different gameplay experience. There are exceptions, of course. Celeste comes to mind, where the DLC is significantly more difficult. But with a lot of games, people get DLC expecting to be able to jump right back into a game they haven't played in months, and just get more of the experience they remember enjoying. And that's not what they got in Tag 1. Tag 1 is more like a classic 90s PC expansion pack, like Brood War for StarCraft. Old expansion packs were in some cases targeted at players who at least semi-regularly played the game and were ready to dive in deeper. Expansion packs could be very rewarding if you were an experienced player, or overwhelming if you didn't know what you were doing. With the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, downloadable content became the norm, and lots of games started getting expansions. 
but developers didn't have to rely on just their dedicated player base picking up the new extra challenging expansion off the Circuit City shelves. DLC was widely available to casual audiences, and now anyone could make some additional missions to whatever game and easily sell them for a few bucks to the casual player. As of the publication of this video, DLC expansions have been common practice for a good 15 years now, and DLCs being accessible casual experiences is what many people are used to. We have to think about how most people play games. They play something once, maybe twice. They probably won't even finish it. It doesn't mean they didn't like it, but games can be long and lives are busy. Doom Eternal does have a nice sized dedicated player base, but the majority of people who played the game probably only played it once or a couple times back in March 2020 and then moved on. So put yourself in this position. You played Doom Eternal all the way through twice when it came out, and you said, man, that's one of the best games I've ever played. Can't wait for the DLC. And then you don't play it again after that. You don't grind to beat it on Ultra Nightmare. You don't learn about quick swapping. You still don't understand how grenades work. You're not really used to using the flame belch intelligently. You try to use the meat hook and it just gets you killed. You still run out of ammo because your chainsaw usage isn't great. You're not watching streams or YouTube channels that talk about strategy. But you love the game. You generally engaged in the game's systems and you made it through. You didn't master it, but the game blew you away and you're excited to see what's next. Fast forward 7 months and Tag 1 comes out. You load it up ready to play some Doom Eternal again, but you're super rusty. The game dumps you into the first level with no progression system. It just gives you every weapon, every upgrade, every ability, every rune. You don't remember which button is which weapon. You don't remember the flame belch. You don't know anything about the faltering system. You forgot about the ice bomb. You haven't seen a single video on weapon strategies or anything like that. You're just here to play more of that game you remember loving. And what happens? You get your shit kicked in. Immediately, in the first room. You're barely surviving the first few encounters, seemingly on luck alone. And then you get to the first arena, and you're there for like an hour because it's so much more brutal than anything you remember. And you suck because you haven't played in seven months. You're getting locked into rooms against tyrants, new possessed demons are pounding your face in, low visibility fog sections with hidden tentacles are frustrating you, buffed marauders kill you in seconds, the final boss fight feels impossible to pass. What's your reaction going to be? They ruined the game, it's way too hard now, I hate this DLC. That's how a lot of people felt. That's why it has the Steam score that it has, a 70% compared to over 90 for the base game. Meanwhile, the dedicated player base was rejoicing. It felt like we got exactly what we wanted, an expansion made for people to express their knowledge of the game, and rip and tear like never before. It was intense, it was creative, it has some of the coolest levels and arena fights in the entire game. For many players, not just the hardcore, Tag 1 to this day is considered the definitive Doom Eternal experience. In my opinion, it's infinitely replayable due to its excellent combat, level design, and intensity. Tag 1 felt like the developers had a much better understanding of their own game, and were sending a strong message of their commitment to their philosophy. They even made the final Slayer Gate more difficult after the hardcore player base said it was too tame. They actually went too far and made it obnoxiously difficult, causing a bit of a backlash, so they had to pull it back a little and now it's in a nice place. Tag 1 is a very satisfying challenge for many players who are familiar with Doom Eternal's mechanics, but it's overwhelming and merciless to many other players who aren't. I'm not saying that every single person that disliked Tag 1 did so for difficulty reasons. Everyone is different, there's things you can critique in Tag 1 just like you can in the base game or any other game. For some it was the new enemies, for some it was the story, for some it was the lack of a progression system. But the really loud criticism was the difficulty. The negative reaction to Tag 1 from some of the more casual fans must have been startling to the devs at id Software. They made something that doubled down on their game's philosophy of skill-based combat and the mastery of your tools, and ended up alienating some of the people who absolutely love their game but just don't have the time to play it a bunch, or simply don't have an interest in repeatedly playing a game to get better at it. Looking back on the release of Tag 1, I think id Software could have prevented this with an interactive tutorial refresher section. And I'll bet this is what they're going to do with any future DLC expansions for their next games. 
Imagine if the first time you booted up Tag 1, you were greeted with an option to go over the skills you learned in the base game months ago. Stage 1 has you dash backwards to avoid a Baron attacking you. Stage 2 challenges you to kill 3 Kako Demons using Sticky Bombs, break 3 Arachnotron Cannons with the Precision Bolt, and break 4 Mancubus Cannons with the Ballista. Stage 3 makes you burn groups of fodder enemies with a Flame Belch and blow them up with a rocket. Stage 4 makes you toss a grenade to set up a blood punch on a Cyber Mancubus and an Ice Bomb blood punch on the Doom Hunter. Stage 5 makes you meat hook onto an Imp and then jump onto a stack of boxes. Stage 6 shows you the benefits of weapon swapping by having you shoot a Kako Demon with the Ballista and then immediately switch to the Super Shotgun to go in for the meat hook kill. And then you rotate between killing an enemy on the left with the Precision Bolt and an enemy on the right with the Rocket Launcher, 5 on each side in 10 seconds and so on and so on. Something like this would have been monumentally helpful to players who were returning from a long period away from playing the game. It should have been there. Those user scores would be much higher. But hey, lessons learned. And they tried to implement a simplified version of this when Tag 2 came out. The game now features a welcome video that shows footage of someone using multiple equipment types together and just generally playing smart. I'm glad it's there, but it only helps a fraction of the people it needs to help. Because as Hugo said, it's not about figuring out what to do, it's about mastering it. Well, you can't master anything if you don't remember it, or if you never really learned it to begin with, and I expect the next games will be better about this. But this was not the end of the difficulty discussion surrounding Doom Eternal. Much crazier things were on the way. In December of 2020, the first official downloadable Master Level was released, and it was noticeably more ambitious and difficult than the first two Master Levels that were included with the base game. The Super Gornest Master Level was insane. Every encounter was high pressure, and if you hadn't been engaging in the PC mod scene, which most people weren't, and if you hadn't played Tag 1, which not everyone had, Super Gornest was a brutal spike in difficulty. But it was also very creative. There was a Marauder encounter in the fog, a buff totem fodder room, you get locked in a small room fighting tyrants and carcasses and a doom hunter, two Marauders in the toxic tunnel, an arena fight with three arch vials and five tyrants. It was a lot of fun and really raised the bar. Judging by this master level and the first DLC expansion, the dedicated Doom Eternal player base was becoming accustomed to id software ramping up the challenge. The community leaders that had YouTube channels and Twitch streams were learning to dominate these levels, and were regularly engaging in the exploding mod scene and playing Horde mode, which saw an incredible second part come out in December that built upon the Tag 1 assets. Around this time, the developers started reaching out, trying to find players that could help them address persistent bugs that were hindering the experience, like the Blood Punch glitch and the Chainsaw No Target glitch. A team was put together to fix these issues, and eventually great progress was made. The Doom Eternal community was in a good place, but a disconnect was forming. The player base was unknowingly fracturing into players who were very casual, players who played an average amount, players who played all the time, and players who were becoming gods at the game. The majority of players that had prominent voices were becoming gods, or at least playing so frequently that they knew the game inside and out. No matter which group you found yourself in, though, we were all anxiously awaiting the release of the second and final DLC expansion, The Ancient Gods Part 2. In the weeks leading up to the release of Tag 2, director Hugo Martin and Bethesda community manager Joshua Boyle were doing streams where they would periodically mention what they were working on for the new DLC. They revealed new demons like the Screecher, who would explode and buff all surrounding enemies if killed, and the Stone Imp, which was weak to the full auto shotgun. They talked up the new Armored Baron that had a breakable weak point and armor weak to the plasma rifle, and they really talked up the final boss, which they said was shaping up to be the best boss fight in all of Doom Eternal. The levels of hype were absurd. The trailer came out, announcing Tag 2 would be available on March 18th, almost exactly one year after Doom Eternal's launch. Leading up to the trailer, there was some doubt about when Tag 2 would come out. There hadn't been any word about a release date, and since both DLCs were included in the Year 1 Pass, there was the question of whether or not that actually meant it had to come out before the one-year anniversary. 
The confusion around the release date was understandable, because for the entirety of the development of both DLCs, id Software was working under quarantine due to COVID, which had shut the world down just a week or two before the game came out. So all updates, fixes, and DLC were being done while working at home. It's a nightmare situation for many working in game design. It severely affects their ability to test things, ideas get approved without being fully fleshed out, and supervisors can't simply sit down and try something out. They have to be sent an updated build of the game every time. Doom Eternal's current state would certainly be different if COVID hadn't happened. We would probably have a lot more master levels, and the DLCs would be even grander experiences. This absolutely has to be kept in mind when discussing aspects of DLC that turned out disappointing or buggy. We will never know what Tag 2 could have been if id Software hadn't had their hundreds of employees quarantined and working from home. The fact that they were able to get two DLC expansions out at the size they were, regardless of how you feel about them, is astounding. So Tag 2 came out, and the reaction from the hardcore player base and community leaders was not positive. In some cases, it was hostile and incoherent. I myself am responsible for some of that. My third playthrough was done on stream, and I found myself furious. As the weekend rolled around, the Steam scores reflected the discontent from the dedicated players, and one by one, prominent Doom Eternal YouTube channels were uploading videos with varying degrees of negativity. Not every single prominent voice in the community was expressing disapproval of the new DLC, but it certainly appeared to be a lot. The Doom Eternal community was in full backlash mode. And there was harassment. Players in any space, whether it was Discord, Reddit, Facebook groups, Twitter, they felt like they couldn't even say they enjoyed Tag 2 without people ganging up and insulting them. And there are plenty of people who like Tag 2. It was awful to see that just saying you had fun with it ended up inviting ridicule. People were being horrible to each other. I put out my review of Tag 2, which I promptly took down due to how unconstructive my criticism was, as I largely focused on the anger I felt, and that overshadowed the real points I was trying to make. It just stirred up people's fury even more, and that made me very uncomfortable. So I redid my review to restate most of my original points in more constructive ways, while also addressing the community outrage surrounding this controversial DLC. I didn't want to burn everything down, I wanted to help right the ship. And if I could take a moment to talk about my experience, I have been bothered by the way I handled Tag 2's launch for the entire year that followed. I've been confused by it, because my anger-filled review was not done in some live, off-the-cuff manner. It was a scripted video that had to be recorded, edited, and checked several times over a period of three to four days before I uploaded it only to be horrified by the effect it had. I quickly became embarrassed by the video, and for months I tried to understand why I thought it was the right thing to make such an aggressive and angry video directed towards a developer that I had come to admire so much. Why was I yelling at and insulting the people who I really just wanted to understand me and help make things better? It was like we collectively went blind for a few days. It was really weird. That's why I wanted to make this video, because the emotional reaction to Tag 2 doesn't make sense on the surface. I needed to take a look at myself, at other players, at the developers and their thought process, and figure out why everyone lost their fucking minds. So what the fuck happened? The days following the release of Tag 2 saw a community in total disarray, complaining mostly about the lack of difficulty. Several arena fights felt too tame, large parts of levels felt kinda empty, the arenas all kinda had a samey feel to them, some new enemies weren't popular with everyone but that happened in Tag 1 with the Spirit and Bloodmaker, and there's enemies in the base game that some people hate so I don't think that's entirely relevant. There's all kinds of things you can criticize, but two large factors were the final boss fight and the addition of the Sentinel Hammer. So buckle up everybody, because we gotta take a deep look into the issues with those two things specifically. I'll start with the Dark Lord boss fight. Now, just calling it good or bad isn't helpful. All I can do is help you understand why a lot of players were let down by this fight. Some of them on repeat playthroughs even elect to stop playing Tag 2 as soon as they get to him. And to understand it, we have to look at the other boss fights in the game, and how they differ from Doom 2016. 
The fun of Doom 2016 was dealing with loads of demons at a time, but boss fights followed an old-school 90s 1v1 format in circular spaces, so boss fights kind of felt like you were playing a different game. There was nowhere to go, no verticality except for the pillars in the final boss, and there were no other enemies to deal with. You're just focusing on a big bullet sponge and learning their attack patterns. I'm not calling them bad, I'm just saying they don't capitalize on the strengths of Doom 2016's combat loop. When designing Eternals boss fights, they decided to include other demons so it didn't feel like a switch to 1v1. It keeps boss fights very active, engaging in the combat loop while focusing on a big bad guy. And the boss fights ask you to engage in multiple mechanics that the game wants you to be learning as you play. The Doom Hunter has a weapon-specific weakness to the plasma rifle and takes extra damage from blood punches, which encourages grenade setups, and now ice bomb setups ever since they updated the fight to allow you to freeze him. The arenas contain many platforming opportunities, which plays well into the newly picked up super shotgun with the meat hook that lets you fly around, while carcasses, gargoyles, and prowlers constantly get in your way. The first encounter with the Marauder acts as a mini-boss fight, checking your mastery of movement, spatial awareness, timing, and weapon combos during stun opportunities. The Gladiator pushes hard on quick reaction time to his flashing attack, fast navigation to stay at a safe distance and gather resources, strong defensive tactics, and increasing damage output in his second phase. The Con Maker fight emphasizes long-distance accuracy, air mobility, hitting enemy weak points to refill resources, meat hook mobility to hit blood punches during windows of vulnerability, dodging dangerous projectiles, and smart navigation of platforms. The Icon of Sin fight has a huge emphasis on arena awareness and movement using platforms, jump pads, and portals. You're dealing with heavy and super heavy demons, using the crucible to reduce enemy pressure, dodging devastating melee attacks and projectiles, and dealing focused long-term damage during moments when you're not being defensive. The Seraphim fight from Tag 1 requires fast aiming and long distance precision, enemy prioritization as you're fighting possessed demons and blood makers that can destroy you with their debuffing projectiles, defensive space control while zapping spirits, resource management so you have enough plasma to kill spirits, advanced mobility using various heights of platforms and several portals, a platforming section with rotating hazards and scanning lasers while caco demons spawn in, and quick weapon combos to eliminate roaming eyeball hazards. Every boss fight has some kind of combination of important aspects of the core gameplay experience that Doom Eternal offers, and as the game goes on, the boss fights push harder and harder on what it expects you to know. In the case of the Seraphim fight, the AI is actually quite simple. The Seraphim just teleports around and shoots projectiles at you. It's nothing special. What makes the fight work is everything that supports him. He and all the other things you're dealing with create an appropriate Doom Eternal fight because you're engaging in so many things the game wants you to have been focusing on, just leaning more towards Tag 1's overall emphasis on accuracy, movement, and dealing with spirits. So we understand what makes Doom Eternal's boss fights what they are, and all of this gives us a better understanding of why Tag 2's Dark Lord boss fight didn't go over so well it seemed to just strip away everything that made the other boss fights so good. Many complained that his AI is just too simple and boring. It's really just five long phases of waiting for him to attack, stunning him with a hammer, and then shooting him. But like I said with the Seraphim, it's not really about the AI being simple. It's about everything else in the fight that you need to think about, and the Dark Lord boss fight just doesn't have it. Most noticeable is the lack of platforming. The entire fight is in an open, flat space. Now, the first Marauder is kind of like that, and so is the Gladiator, but the Marauder fight is quite short, it's not five phases. And it's such a simple encounter because it's just a mini-boss that introduces the player to the concept of a more defensive style fight with specific attack windows. It didn't need to be more complex. And the Gladiator only has one phase where you're interrupting him in a short window, and then he goes crazy and summons in heavy support demons. He controls so much space and can hop around so suddenly that a flat basic arena works well for the fight. The Gladiator also drops his shield after the first round and the fight becomes much more active, with you constantly firing at him while you move. The Dark Lord keeps his shield for the entire fight and you never get a single moment where you can just shoot at him and play aggressively. 
I think that's a large part of why the fight leads to a very flat ending to the DLC. It's all defense and runaway. The Dark Lord fight unfortunately doesn't contain anything to make the fight interesting on top of the basic behaviors of the boss. No platforms, no hazards, no weak point targeting, no heavy super heavy demon harassment except for a very limited amount of ethereal demon spawns that die to a single hammer smash. And unlike the Gladiator, who can actually be damaged behind his shield if you get airborne, and the Marauder, who has a variety of ways to engage him, like shooting sticky bombs and rockets at his feet for splash damage, ballista feet falters to set up combos, microwave beam dog falters for a free ballista shot, lock-on rockets one-cycle combos, and other creative options to go beyond simply waiting for the flash and doing a basic super shotgun ballista combo and then waiting again, the Dark Lord fight seems to be designed to have one specific way to engage him for all five phases, which is to get close to him, wait for him to attack, which he frustratingly doesn't do for long periods of time, interrupt him, stun him with the hammer, and shoot. Then run away and fill up the hammer again, and repeat. It's a very inactive way to be engaging in a boss fight. It would have been fine for an opening round, but the fight never changes other than having to dodge a charge attack and some bombs, and hammering the ghost demons that don't even have weak points. Like the other boss fights, it is asking you to use mechanics the game wants you to know, namely the hammer and good dodging skills, but there isn't enough to make it satisfying. This isn't how a lot of people wanted to finish Doom Eternal's story fighting the Dark Lord himself, in a very passive and wait-and-counter fashion. Director Hugo Martin stated a few times that if they'd had the time and COVID wasn't happening, they would have loved to make the Dark Lord turn into a dragon and make the fight really crazy. But that's not really the point. The Seraphim fight, also made during COVID, works with a very simple boss AI, but makes the fight interesting through its arena design, hazards, and enemy combinations. The Dark Lord didn't need to turn into a giant spectacle to please fans, it just needed to engage more in the aspects of Doom Eternal that make it so fun. Not everyone dislikes the Dark Lord boss fight, but enough definitely do, for all the reasons I stated and it was made worse by the fact that the experience leading up to the fight was underwhelming due to the aforementioned toned-down difficulty across the board, and especially the hammer. The Sentinel Hammer is awesome, but it's also a busted weapon. It stuns enemies, refills ammo, and multiplies armor and health gain. And it's a very fun weapon to use, what makes it busted is how easy it is to refill. It only needs two charges, which come from breaking weak points or performing glory kills. Two things that are very easy to do in this game and happen all the time. You can hammer everyone, do a bunch of damage, run away, and get two easy glory kills and then hammer everyone again. You can hammer a Mancubus, break his two cannons, and now you have another hammer. So when you take the ridiculous power of the hammer and how easy it is to obtain it, and combine that with combat encounters that are noticeably tamer than Tag 1, and levels feeling like they're lacking significant pressure points, and a boss fight that deflates the experience, you can start to understand why many players were disappointed by Tag 2. That doesn't explain the anger, certainly, but we'll get there. Deciding how many charges the hammer should require must have been a contentious topic inside id Software leading up to Tag 2's release, and shortly after, PC mods were released that doubled the charge requirement to 4, making the hammer feel much more appropriate. If you play the official Horde mode from October 2021's Update 6.66, you know how the change to the hammer from 2 to 4 charges makes it fit nicely into the arsenal as a powerful option that you actually have to fight for if you want it. But the question is why? Why did they decide to go with only two charges for the Sentinel Hammer when it so obviously breaks the game in the hands of even just a semi-competent player? The fact of the matter is, they just didn't have time to introduce the Hammer in a way that made all players feel comfortable with it. Remember what it was like the first time you played Doom Eternal and it took you several levels to get the hang of the Flame Belch? Well, they didn't have that kind of time. The DLC is only three levels, and they're introducing a brand new mechanic, on top of an already giant arsenal. 
They're thinking about the negative reaction to Tag 1, and being extra careful not to overwhelm the general audience this time. They wanted the hammer to be simple and easily obtainable, so anyone could get the hang of it and start having fun with it right away. They saw the hammer as a vital ingredient to the enjoyment of Tag 2, and they thought having easy access to it would help out those players who felt overwhelmed by Tag 1's intensity. If you think back to the first time you played Doom Eternal, you probably made it through the game forgetting to use certain things. There's just so much to learn. Hell, I played the game for like a month without using Blood Punch. It took most people a while to figure out Meat Hook mobility. Some people played it and never used grenades. It's a lot to ask a regular person to keep in their mind. They wanted to send a loud message that the hammer is a thing and they want you to use it. So while a room like this, full of hammer charges, to a skilled player probably seems like a stupid waste of time, it's actually a really nice reminder for casual players who may be forgetting about the hammer that they should be using it. Giving them a room where they just hit the hammer button 10 times will get them used to using it if they aren't already, which is only going to increase their enjoyment of the missions. The Pinky Blood Punch room is good for this too. It's not a super challenging room, but they just thought it would be fun for people to get to blood punch some pinkies for a bit, and it's a good room to remind players about the power of the blood punch. It makes sense. When you step back and look at it from a design perspective targeting a wide audience, it makes sense that they would make the hammer very easy to obtain when they only have a few levels to get you into the mechanic as opposed to an entire game. I'm sure it paid off for a good amount of the general audience. The unfortunate downside was that anyone who is already fairly competent at the game and could figure out the hammer quickly was immediately able to break the game and trivialize every encounter by using the shiny new weapon they were supposed to be enjoying. And we did want to enjoy it. The hammer is badass and very fun to use. The game made us want to use something that was actively hurting our experience. We were stunning entire rooms of enemies over and over. We never had to use the chainsaw. The Marauder was humiliated by single weapon attacks after a year of everyone trying to figure out creative ways to kill him. It felt like the entire Doom Eternal combat loop that we fell in love with was falling apart. People were not happy. Not just that, they were pissed. The people who didn't like Tag 2 really didn't like it, and since a lot of the community voices didn't like it, it became very public. The discourse surrounding Tag 2 was incredibly emotional, at times irrational, and not constructive. And I'm not just talking about the player side, it was on the developer side as well. I hate to single out Hugo on this because id Software is more than one person. I'm sure lots of people at id who were working hard on this DLC to get it completed by March 20th while in quarantine were frustrated and angry with the way the community was reacting to Tag 2. It's just that Hugo is the only guy we get to hear from. So this isn't meant to single him out, but I have to bring up his slash id Software's reaction to the community reaction because both sides were acting like they weren't listening to each other, and that's largely because neither side understood each other, because neither side knew how to express what the actual issues were. All the community could hear from the developers was, you guys are acting entitled, you're way beyond the normal skill level, and you're just complaining that this DLC isn't as hard as the crazy PC mods you play. And all the developers could hear from the community was, you're watering down this game for casual players that don't even play your game, and you've made a crappy DLC that ignores your dedicated player base. Both sides were yelling at each other. Of course everyone was going to take this personally. The devs made something they felt proud of and worked really hard on, and it was being crapped on by all the big known players, and it was getting poor fan reviews and the players felt like their favorite game was being downgraded and they felt betrayed. And in case there's some misunderstanding, this video isn't about justifying their reaction to Tag 2. It's just about trying to explain it. To make matters worse, on the same day that Tag 2 came out, Tag 1 received balance changes that toned down the opening combat encounters, removed enemies from certain arenas in the first level, replaced the Possessed Baron with a Possessed Hell Knight in level 2, and removed hidden tentacles from levels 2 and 3, while also nerfing the Bloodmaker found in Tag 1 and Tag 2. Now, whether or not they should have changed Tag 1 is a separate question, but it doesn't matter. 
The result was that on top of Tag 2 feeling like a weak entry that seemed to go against key Doom Eternal principles, Tag 1, which was adored by the dedicated player base, got changed on the same day, which just ended up pouring salt in the wounds. It amplified everyone's anger, including my own. And I want to hone in on that point about going against key Doom Eternal principles, because that takes us back to my main point, that legendary quote from Hugo Martin. The power fantasy that's earned is much more satisfying than the one that's just handed to you. The Doom Eternal community had spent a year not just playing the game, but advocating for it. It was a controversial decision to make a skill-based first-person shooter instead of a simple corridor shooter where you just abuse one broken gun. People stood up and defended the game's philosophy. We championed the focus on resource management, weapon variety, weapon combos, enemy AI, and smart movement. We believed very strongly in the concept of Doom Eternal being a game that demands that the player learn how to play the game well in order to be successful and have fun. We openly mocked terrible reviews that failed to understand what the game was about. We called out popular personalities for misrepresenting the game's design. We celebrated the game for its bold vision and doubling down on player accountability. And suddenly, with the release of Tag 2, we felt like id Software was walking back from the design that we had been championing. Suddenly, it wasn't that important to have smart chainsaw use to keep your ammo stocked. Just abuse the hammer all day and get ammo for free. Suddenly, you didn't need to figure out good ways to damage the marauder during a fight. Just stun him with the hammer once and shoot him with one gun until he dies. And in those first days, in response to the criticism that the hammer was invalidating core principles of Doom Eternal's design, we heard that they made the hammer work the way it does because they just wanted people to feel powerful as they played this final chapter of Doom Eternal. That was a very telling moment because you can see the contradiction in these two statements. The power fantasy that's earned is much more satisfying than the one that's just handed to you, and we just wanted the player to feel powerful. The problem is that we already felt powerful, because the game's design makes you feel powerful by learning its systems. And suddenly, we're hearing that a tool that allows you to ignore those systems is supposed to make you feel powerful. We can't have both. That's where the rage came from. Doom Eternal's hardcore fans are ideological in a way, believing in what it stands for just as much as enjoying how fun it is to play. They aren't just playing a game, they're fighting for a game design philosophy they believe in. And it hurt like hell to feel like the developers may be abandoning it. The overreaction is also a symptom of years of seeing game studio after game studio repeatedly screw over their audiences with broken games and predatory business practices. Seeing id Software wavering on their message brought up all kinds of trauma that people have experienced in seeing many of their other beloved franchises get destroyed. So we ended up lashing out at id Software like we would at any other studio. We yelled and screamed at them as if they were EA or Blizzard. And we really shouldn't have, because I think id Software is one of the few AAA devs out there that actually wants to do something great. Many players feel like they screwed up with Tag 2, but that doesn't automatically turn them into one of those horrible developers out there that only cares about the bottom line. A lot of the issues that the community had concerning Tag 2's design weren't being expressed in constructive and rational ways, so the devs weren't reacting in constructive and rational ways either. We heard things like, only the PC mod Ultra Nightmare players think Tag 2 is too easy. It's a minority of players that are just being really loud. And that wasn't the case. It just happens to be the case that a lot of the voices of the community are PC mod Ultra Nightmare players. It doesn't mean that they were the only ones upset with the DLC's direction and apparent shift in philosophy. As an experiment, I invited several friends to my house one by one to play Tag 2. They are Doom Eternal players, but they don't really play Master Levels, they don't play PC mods, and though they do play on the Nightmare difficulty, they cannot beat the campaign on Ultra Nightmare. They can't get past level 3. I sat them down at my PC and had them play Tag 2 and I just observed. I didn't tell them what I thought of it. And I could see that even they felt underwhelmed by the experience. 
I talked with a lot of players in my Discord community about how they felt, and I heard from a wide variety of people, from Ultra Nightmare players down to casual Hurt Me Plenty players, and I heard a lot of the same things. They felt like something just wasn't right. And it has nothing to do with production value. The game looks great, there's amazing action in the background. Obviously a hell of a lot of work was put into making it look and feel up to quality. The main issue was the gameplay, and the direction the story took wasn't satisfactory to some, but that's a discussion for another day and another channel. But I want to make something clear. Tag 2 is not an easy DLC. It is easy when compared to Tag 1 or Master Levels, but much like Tag 1, if you don't know how to play, you're screwed. Tag 2 still requires you to make use of the Flame Belch, cycle through weapons, stay mobile, pace your dashes, prioritize enemies, multitask, even something as simple as super shotgunning the Marauder, slamming the hammer down, and then switching to a fully automatic weapon to kill him, is a complex set of actions that demands a lot of a player who doesn't know the game well. It's absolutely worth noting that Tag 2 has several really nice high pressure moments with creative setups. I like this hallway with Hell Knights, creatures, and invisible whiplashes. The opening room buffed pinky ambush catches you off guard and forces you to react quickly. Fighting two marauders and a baron in a room with respawning creatures is devilishly fun. And they offered higher level challenges in the form of escalation encounters where skilled players could trigger an optional second wave of combat. It just didn't go as high as people wanted. These were nice inclusions, but some players felt they simply didn't go far enough. Tag 2 was not made to be straight up easy across the board, it just felt like an overall downgrade of intensity when many players were expecting things to really ramp up for this final hurrah. And that's ultimately where the decision to make Tag 2 a lighter experience failed, because while they toned down the experience to avoid some of the backlash they got from casual players during Tag 1, it still wasn't enough. Tag 2, even with the lighter combat experience and broken abusable hammer, was still criticized by casual players for being too hard. Because like I said, if you're no good at the game, you're gonna get your butt kicked because Tag 2 starts at full tilt right away like Tag 1, with no progression system or reintroduction to the arsenal or mechanics. In a way, you could say the developers didn't want to pick a side with Tag 2 the way they did with Tag 1. They tried to play it right down the middle, and as a result, they ended up not making it easy enough for people who complained about Tag 1, and they pissed off the people who love Tag 1, and you're left with a bunch of people unhappy on both sides. Coming out of this experience, the devs probably have a stronger understanding of where they need to focus, what kind of feedback they need to pay attention to, and what they want to stand for going forward. In the weeks after Tag 2's launch, Hugo Martin did a series of interviews on Doom Eternal channels. Appearing on Tyler McVicker's channel, he did an interview on my channel which was really fun, he talked with speedrunner Zai, and he showed that id Software wanted to listen to the fans' concerns. And the fans wanted to listen as well, and better understand why Tag 2 was the way that it was, and how things can improve going forward. The community recovery was in full force in just one week's time. Seven days after Tag 2 came out, I did a live stream to celebrate the one year anniversary of my video on the Marauder that catapulted me into the Doom world, and I had on, I think, 14 different prominent Doom Eternal players, streamers, YouTubers, battle mode players, and we all just talked and had a good time while a few thousand people listened. Hugo even showed up in the chat for a bit. Everyone started to feel good again. We all learned something about ourselves. The Tag 2 controversy actually ended up opening lines of communication between the devs and the players, and led them to understanding each other a lot more. The controversy died down quickly, and the community started moving towards a speedy recovery once the emotions died down. The devs were able to see that it wasn't just the snobby PC mod Ultra Nightmare players complaining that Tag 2 wasn't a sweat fest and the players were able to see that the devs weren't walking away from their philosophy. They had just overcorrected and needed some guidance from the people who had been fighting for their game for a year at that point. Both sides turned out much stronger because of it. 
In the October update, certain encounters in Tag 2 were beefed up to feel more appropriately challenging, which helps with the pacing a lot, and new master levels were introduced that provided a suitable challenge for those looking for something that the DLC expansions don't offer. Tag 2 is a fascinating moment in Doom Eternal's history. It was filled with hysterical drama that made us look insane to anyone on the outside, and that's why I wanted to break down what it was all about. It was a horrible time for anyone involved, community side and dev side, but it resulted in us becoming much stronger, smarter, and more confident. Thank you so much for watching this retrospective on Doom Eternal's DLC. I did this as much for the historical record as I did it for myself. The Tag 2 controversy really has haunted me for a long time, and it feels good to lay it all out and better understand it. Stay tuned to this channel, more exciting things will be coming in the future, Doom Eternal and otherwise, like and subscribe and all that stuff. I'll see you later.